So nature cannot be fooled. And I'll bear that in mind next time we get on a 747. Thank exactly. you. <laughs> so next up we have Stephen Head of the Young Rail Professionals. Stephen. Hi, morning. Uh, so yes, my name's uh, Stephen and uh, my sort of aim of talking to you today is to show you the vast array of opportunities for careers within the rail industry. How many interesting problems there are and uh, different opportunities there are. So I'm going to do that by, or hopefully do that, by talking you through uh, my career to date and the different places that's taken me and the different uh, challenges I've faced as an engineer. And at the end, I'm then going to talk to you a bit about uh, the organisation I'm here to represent today, Young Rail Professionals, and how that's helped me in my journey as well. So, first of all, a bit of background. So, that's me, age 10, cleaning a steam train. So, railways have always been a passion of mine. It is something I still do today. That's me a few months ago. So, so railways has always sort of been something I've been interested in. But, but I never particularly thought about going into the rail industry as a career when I was growing up. Just, it was a passion of mine for a hobby, but I didn't really see it being my day job. Um, I did, however, always feel passionate about engineering and knew that's sort of where, where I wanted to go. Um, and so I went to the University of Bristol and did a, a degree called Engineering Design. Uh, this was uh, the output of our, our fifth year uh, final project, group project, and looking at osmotic power stations. So, so in this degree we covered all sorts of different things. We did a bit of civil, a bit of electrical, electronics, mechanical, aero, and also focused a reasonable amount on soft skills. So uh, good communication, uh, how to manage, how to work in teams, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so a very interesting degree, uh, really suited me and it was what I wanted, getting that broad understanding. Um, and another key aspect for me was that it had a lot of industry engagement. So uh, you were required to, as part of the course, do uh, two summer placements and a year in industry. And so, so getting that in early engagement with industry and understanding actually what it mean to be an engineer was very important to me. You know, when you're a a-level student and you're sort of picking university degrees or whatever you sort of so I picked engineering but I didn't really I probably couldn't really have told you what does an engineer actually do I just knew I was interested to learn about how things work and how to design stuff and all that sort of stuff um, but having that industrial experience as part of the course was very important to me I spent my uh, year in industry and two summer placements with Arup they're a big uh, civil engineering uh, consultancy firm and, and as I said when I started that I wasn't particularly thinking I want to go into the rail industry you know I just wanted to see what, what was out there so I started my uh, summer placement in the civil engineering department making my way, way around the different teams and as you probably would expect when I got to the rail team actually something just sort of clicked I, I had a passion for it I was interested in talking to the guys and actually it just fitted me very well so I ended up spending my entire year in industry and my second summer placement in the rail team with Aaron. Um, and this was civil engineering based, so doing permanent way design, so this is track alignment, um, what's the substructure, bridges, all that sort of stuff. And one of the major projects I worked on uh, was this. Uh, this is a new depot at Three Bridges. So back in 2007, when I was doing my year in industry, I did the first uh, sort of feasibility designs for this, well, for this and other sites. So for me, it's brilliant fun. So it's basically taking um, an ordnance survey map of various sites. We had about eight different sites uh, that I had to look at. Taking an ordnance survey map uh, of a fairly blank space, and they just said, "Well, design a depot. How do you think you should have it? Where do you want to put the shed? Where do you want to put the wash? Where do you want to put?" And, and for me, it's brilliant. It's just building a, a railway. Um, so that was a really interesting project and actually got me thinking about a lot of the, the fundamentals about how railways work, you know, how the processing through the depot, what you need there. And as a project, it also uh, showed me the wider, you know, that, that bringing in those softer 
side, softer skills and softer side of the industry, having to go to stakeholder meetings, understand, you know, this was a very political, had a lot of politics around the project as well, so there was various sites that I told I had to make a feasible design for, even though it was completely impractical because we needed to keep a that location on the table. Um, so yeah, but a very interesting project. And, and this is when I came across Interfleet, who's the company I joined after graduation. So, so I spent, uh, let's say, a month doing up a whole load of designs, you know, tweaking them, making them how I thought was really good. I'd take them along to a, a stakeholder meeting with the Department of Transport and other key stakeholders, and there was always one guy in these meetings. That each month I'd go along with my nice, shiny designs that I'd worked really hard on, and he'd just put in loads of, like, odd ideas and say, well, actually, if we just put that all the other way around, then it could be really, you know, much better. And they're always really good ideas. But it meant I had to go away and do the legwork for the next month to redesign it all. Um, so when I get towards the end of my degree, I thought he had a pretty good job. So I decided to go and look to see where he worked. So he worked for a company called Interfleet, and that's the company I joined uh, on graduation. Uh, they're a specialised railway consultancy firm, uh, so born out of uh, British Railways. But so a company solely focused on the rail industry. Uh, but looking at all parts of the industry. So they'll do um, uh, rolling stock design, uh, they'll do modifications on rolling stock, they'll do the maintenance instructions. So as I'm, you, you may be aware with, with, rail, or with railway vehicles and I'm sure with planes and other things like that, there's very strict maintenance instructions that you have to follow and plan. And so, so we do work looking at those. Um, assurance, again, you know, safety is uh, critical in the rail industry, there's very strict assurance processes, so being involved in that. Um, transport uh, planning, so actually um, where, where do we want a railway? Do we want a, a, a light rail system, a, a metro, a tram system? Th that sort of planning. So as a consultancy, Interfleet really does touch all different parts of the rail industry. And that really interested me. Oh, and, and especially the graduate scheme, where you start off doing six-week placements and, all, you know, and you can experience all of these different elements of the industry. And for me, that was really important. So still after a year in industry and two summer placements and spending a lot of that time in the rail industry, I still wasn't quite sure where I wanted to be within the industry. What sort of element did I really want to work in or focus on? And so the fact that I could join this graduate scheme and see all the different parts of the industry really interested me. One of the <coughs> uh, projects I got involved with uh, in my first year was fitting remote condition monitoring to these uh, high-speed trains. So these run up and down the East Coast Main Line, London up to Scotland and various places. And they're, they're reasonably old trains, um, probably nearly as old as I am. Uh, and we had to go and retrofit some con remote condition monitoring onto these trains. And so you're going into fairly old systems, fairly busy, cluttered trains, and having to work out where to fit your, you know, where to actually physically fit the kit, and then also think through, well, what, what piece of information are we going to collect from this train, and uh, how are we going to collect them, how does that all work, how do we process that information. So a very, very interesting uh, project, and also quite challenging having to, to retrofit things to rolling stuff naturally. The, the rail industry does loads of this because we never really get rid of the old trains at the minute. We keep building new ones, which is brilliant, but uh, we need more and more trains, so we never really get rid of the old, old ones yet. But it means there's a lot of retrofitment, and we have to go back and keep things up to date and keep adding the new technology into this uh, fairly old uh, existing train. So that was a very interesting uh, thing for me, uh, doing actual design work on electrical schematics, getting involved in the mechanical design as well, how are we actually going to hold this kit in place. Um, and I then got the opportunity to actually go to the manufacturing firm, do a placement with them as the kit was actually being uh, assembled and being involved in seeing that all coming together. And then I also went down and spent a placement on the railway depot where it was being installed and working with the guys on the shop floor actually getting this kit installed and commissioned on the train. So a really interesting project from my point of view and allowed me to see a broad range um, of the activities that happen in the rail industry, particularly around rolling stock. 
Um, another a very interesting thing I got involved in on the graduate scheme was uh, building this. So, uh, as you may be aware, the IMECI run what's called the Railway Challenge. Um, so, they also run a Formula Student, which is where you build a uh, racing car. And this is a new competition, well, it's now four or five years old, where teams of graduates have to build a miniature railway locomotive. And so, for me, this is brilliant fun. And, uh, it was a very intense time scale. We had something like 10 weeks to design this, and that design work had to be done in our own time. And then we had five weeks at college to build it. And when you sit down, so there's about 10 of us in our team, and you sit down at the start of this, and, and it's an amazing experience, because you start off and say, well, how many wheels do we want to have? Do we want to have two axles or four, or, or six? And actually, how do, we want to, how do we want to power this loco? We could have... Um, you know, the uh, petrol engine or diesel engine direct drive to the wheels. We could use electric motors. We could use hydraulics. How do we want to stop it? What type of brakes do we want? So, so actually having to start with a blank piece of paper and actually come up with an actual thing that works and meets the, the spec um, was a really, really interesting experience. And, and again, lots of compromises about we had, we had a fixed budget. We had fairly tight timescales to build this, so how do we de-risk that? You see we've got, in the middle there, is literally an off-the-shelf petrol generator that we did just buy, plonk on the frame, bolt it down, and plug our electricals into. So we completely de-risked actually having to build a power source. We just bought it off the shelf. Um, and likewise with the brakes, we just bought uh, fairly simple clutch brakes that we just bought, put onto the axles, it all on and then that's our braking system um, and, but then a lot of other areas we um, had to have regenerative braking and, and actually when you try to build a regenerative braking system on quite a tight budget and in quite a, a short time scale it is very, very challenging but we, we did it, we got some super capacitors and ductors and all sorts of different bits in those boxes that allowed us to do regenerative braking so this was a really, really interesting project uh, for all of us and it made us think a lot about the fundamentals of actually railway engineering <coughs> uh, and what it involves. And we went on to win, which made it even better. <laughs> so that, that was on, on the graduate scheme. So I really enjoyed the graduate scheme. Uh, seeing all those different parts of the rail industry, I think served me in very good stead. Seeing the, understanding the range of different things that go on. Um, and more importantly, because when you get th go further down your career, you then end up having to interface with these different departments again, and you have an appreciation of how they work and what they do and why they do it. So after I finished the two years on the graduate scheme, I went down to moved down to London and started working in the rail control systems team. So this is all about how do we the signalling system on the railway, basically. How do we signal the trains? How do we stop them crashing into each other? How do we make sure that it goes the right way? And I spent about three years working on a project on the ERTMS programme. So this is European Rail Traffic Management System. Um, you, you're probably all aware, at the minute, the majority of our network has lights on sticks down the track controlling where the trains go. When, when, the, the, light, when the signal's red, the driver stops. Uh, when it's orange, he knows you've got to slow down. When it's green, he knows you can go. And you also have some position indicators telling him if he's going a divergence route. So that's sort of how we do things now, broadly. Um, ERTMS is moving, getting rid of all those line side signals and putting everything in the cab. So, um, that, that's a pointer. so that screen there is replace the signals and tells the driver how fast he can go and how far he can go. So, so that's the next step in signalling on certainly on the main line. This sort of technology already exists and is in place on uh, underground, so London Underground. Most of the lines are all signalled using similar technology to this. But this is now being rolled out across uh, the UK infrastructure. What, one of the big challenges that the rail industry has is uh, the infrastructure, the legacy infrastructure that it has. So with cars, there tends to be a quicker turn around, you know, they have a shorter life, life duration, although maybe not some of the, the old classics, but generally cars have a quicker lifetime. But with the rail industry, the trains are around for a very long time, 
there's a lot of fixed infrastructure, so tracks, stations, bridges, that actually is very difficult to update and modernise. Um, so that's one of the challenges that the industry faces, and that's why um, actually rolling this out is quite challenging. Um, for example, we have lots of procedures of how, how you operate a train now. So if you think on the station, uh, you've probably seen that the person blows their whistle and holds up a little uh, white baton or a green flag or something to tell the train they can go. But before they've done that, they've looked at the end of the platform to see there's a green signal. Well, when we take all those signals away, how does the person on the platform know they can dispatch the train? Or do we still need a person on the platform? So actually introducing this new technology uh, onto the, the national network is quite a challenge and involves quite a lot of thinking. Um, and then the structure of the industry makes it means that you've got a lot of stakeholders involved. So there's a whole bunch of different stakeholder meetings, trying to get buy-in, trying to get different people engaged, and ensuring you're meeting everyone's needs. So again, that was uh, a steep learning curve for me. Uh, it's a very new technology uh, for the rail industry. It brings a lot of challenges about how you operate it, how you actually deploy it across the network, getting the transitions right, um, and also just <coughs> We had, had a very good project team, and so it's a quite a fun project to be on as well. So that's why I spent about three years, the last three years of my career, uh, working on that ERTMS program and helping roll that out. And then I've recently moved on to a more operational role. So that is a, a Caledonia sleeper train. So these trains run between London and Scotland uh, overnight. So you can leave uh, London at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, you can go and ha have some food and have a drink in the lounge car and you can go to your berth, we've got a nice bed, go to sleep and you wake up in Scotland, various locations in Scotland, at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. So that's the sleeper train. We have um, 75 coaches that run around the country, various formations. And so about six months ago, I moved to become the fleet engineering manager for Serco Caledonia sleepers. Now, this is a very different role from what I've done before. Before I was always fairly um, project-based, so rolling things out, implementing programs. But this is now very day-to-day -day operational. Uh, so this morning I've been having emails about uh, one of our coaches last night that had an issue with one of its brakes, uh, dragging, so, so just rubbing as it's going along. So I've been emailing about that, how we're getting that sorted and resolved, ready for service again. Um, so very immediate, very short term, um, and actually, it, it's, it's, to be honest, it's really good fun because in, as an engineer, you have to think quick, you have to understand the safe parameters you can work in, you have to think up solutions, and uh, it's a very reactive environment. So actually, I'm really enjoying that at the minute, and it's bringing a lot of challenges to me. Um, but likewise, there's still, so there is that day-to-day -day keeping the service running, and then there's also more ongoing plan things, rolling out new processes. Um, these are very old rolling stock. Uh, we've got Mark II coaches which are made in the, the late 70s, so very old, knackered, and we're trying to nurse them along for another few years, so that in itself is very challenging. Got to get some careful balances between how much money are we spending, but still giving a good quality of service to the customer. And um, so yeah, so, so lots going on there as well. So that's sort of a bit of a whistle-stop tour of my uh, career to date. Um, I guess hopefully that shows you there's a whole range of different aspects within the rail industry. And to be honest, there's loads more that I haven't experienced and haven't touched on. But within the rail industry, um, as with most engineers we heard from aeronautics, and a lot of industries cover so, such a broad spectrum of engineering and of um, different problems to solve. And as you heard, it's not just about engineering, there's a lot of human factors and uh, operations and the people side. How do we actually, you know, as, as engineers, we can, we're often very good at making a technical solution, but without understanding how does that work in the actual environment when you've got you know, a guy standing on a platform at two in the morning trying to get a train away, how does that actually work for him at that time, maybe it's pissing down with rain or something, you know, you've got to think of the actual practicalities. And so I think the rail industry is very good for that, making you think and understand and pulling all those pieces together. So a thing, 
uh, I'd like to talk about next is uh, young rail professionals. Uh, so this has been a, a big part of my, my life for the last three years. Um, Young Rail Professionals is an organisation, uh, a not-for-profit limited company that is run by volunteers and is <coughs> run by young people, so I'm in charge and at the minute I'm just handing over to, to my uh, successor in March, but it's run by young people, by volunteers and it was formed by young people as well. The, the aim is um, principally to recruit and retain the next generation of young talent in the rail industry. So um, we put on various networking and development events for young people in the industry with a, quite a focus on bringing people together from all these different parts of the industry. As you've heard, we've got lots of brilliant institutes uh, that are often very good at delivering stuff about their discipline. So the IMFP have an extremely good railway division that deliver a lot of great lectures for mechanical engineers in the rail industry. But what YRP, young rail professionals, what YRP tries to do is give people that cross-discipline understanding. So actually, what as a signalling engineer do I need to know about the mechanical engineering side? And how do, why is marketing so important within the rail industry? And what's the legal structure? And what's a, a, an idiot's guide to signalling for people who know nothing about it? So YRP very much tries to give those opportunities to young people at the start of their career and also provide the opportunity to network and engage and build those links because this industry or all industries are all about the people really. Having those links, having those people that you know when you've got that problem you just ring them up and say actually you know you worked on this a few years ago actually I've got this problem now what did you do before or what do you think about this. Having that network of people within the industry is absolutely vital, whichever, whichever industry you're in, really. And so that's the other element that young world professionals uh, look to give to pe young people in the industry, to build up those networks at the beginning of your career that should stand you in good stead. So hopefully that's given you a, an overview of uh, the organisation, uh, a, a bit of a feel for the rail industry as well. Um, as I said, that's just my experience to date. There's plenty of other exciting things. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Are you going to retrofit condition based monitoring at the Romney higher than Dim Church Miniature Rail? Um, possibly. We have actually installed a driver vigilance device, so there's a PLC on our 90 year old steam trains now that uh, will apply the brakes if the driver is non responsive. So, possibly. Anyone else? I was thinking of maybe the kind of thinking of the sort of soft aspects, maybe. Um, how do you find, so being so working for Interfleet as a consultancy, how do you find the, the interface in the rail industry works between, you know, network rail, the leasing companies, the operating companies, and how, how does that all work or not work? So, uh, very consciously, you feel me going out on uh, <laughs> and I'm a consultant and make my money out of, make my living out of uh, those people, but I think the railway has been very silent. Um, it, you know, you know, rolling stock people would work on the trains, and the track people work on the track, and they just hope it will work together to an extent. You know, there are clearly uh, standards, etc. But the rail industry had been very silent. I think that's starting to change. It's starting to come together. Um, certainly, when you start looking at the you know big projects going on at the minute, uh, Crossrail actually that's got a very integrated program, things like that. So, I think the rail industry is getting better at doing that, and I think really that's you know our generation coming through and wanting that broad understanding um, is helping change that. So, yeah, so, so, but there are, as you uh, sort of highlighted there, it's a very complex industry really. It's got a very complex structure of network rail, you know, companies owning the rolling stock, different companies operating the rolling stock, different people maintaining, all sorts of different parties involved. So actually when you want to do one thing, you've got a lot of people to consult. And especially when you want to do one thing that affects both the train and the track, then you've got 
even more people. So the, that example of ERTMS, it, it touches every part of the industry, and that's why it's such a, a big program and sort of taking, it's so complex to try and understand all those different interfaces and interactions.